God's going to use Moses at some point to his people, but he's going to have to get Moses ready. He's going to have to make and mold Moses into the, to the man of God that he needs and change his life. Woo, it's going to be fun. So we're going to look at uh, three areas of criticism that Moses took. I don't want to look at criticism, but we're going to look at these three areas of criticism that, that changed Moses' life, and we're going to see how he ended up where he was supposed to be so God could use him. Uh, Moses was, uh, uh, and I'm going to read my notes. We're going to look at the criticism of Moses, see how God's character is shined through Moses. Because of his outlook of himself, he was a proud at birth, and as he grew, he shat, was shattered. His life was shattered. Uh, there was a time when Moses ended up, and there was a taskmaster, and he whipped one of the uh, Jewish people, and Moses murdered the taskmaster. And after that, the next day, uh, he saw two Jews, Israelites. They were fighting amongst themselves, and uh, Moses separated them, and they said, are, What are you going to murder us like you did the Egyptian, and Moses fled for his life. He was, he had 40 years, he had grew, grown up in Pharaoh's house. Now for 40, and there goes the camera, and mm, not good. And so 40 years, he's going to, um, he's going to grow up uh, under the uh, authority of Jethro, who eventually would be his father-in-law. And Jethro was, was, uh, a keeper of sheep. So Moses went there, uh, not really on the back side of the desert, but with the Midianites, and he kept the sheep of, of, of his father-in-law. So there was a root of criticism. We see this there here in Numbers chapter number 12. Remember Moses, when he went up into to Mount Sinai, he broke the tablets because of his anger. And I, and I will say, as I was studying this, Moses is just a man. Uh, he's not God, although God uses him greatly. He's just a man. He's not, he is not uh, somebody to be worshipped or somebody to be uh, set on a pedestal, but he's an example. And so the two things we're not going to look at is who Moses is as far as his greatness and or who Moses is as far as the criticism that he would take. He was the friend of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, the Bible says in verse number 7, My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently and not in darkness speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall behold, shall he behold. Wherefore then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against him, and they departed. Remember when Moses broke the tablets. So he's not looking for the power of Moses, the strength of Moses. He's looking for the servants, servant of Moses. Oh, man. The root of the criticism. All right, criticism is the art of judging with propriety of the beauties. Criti criticism is really a word that was birthed out of the word critique. And so the the critiquing is actually the critiquing of the arts, looking into the arts, looking into uh, uh, photography, looking into paintings, uh, looking into, uh, we would say, subjective type um, sporting events like gymnastics and that kind of stuff where there's not an objective goal. The person with the highest score wins, but not necessarily the best person. You know, when we watch baseball and basketball and hockey and those kind of things, the, the team with the most points win, it's very objective. But in the life of, of Moses, he begins to be critiqued and, the, and his critics are those that desire to have his position or those that have a, a desire of, of of pride. And so we have three different groups of people. The very first person that, that Moses is criticized for is the Ethiopian woman. So Moses goes on the backside of the desert. He, he's there with Jethro. He tends sheep for 40 years. He marries um, a lady named Zipporah, and they are Midianites. So there should have been already a complaint about who Moses had married when he came back to free the children of Israel. But they did not look at that uh, in the same light as they would at this Ethiopian wife. Now there's a lot to be said about the Ethiopian wife, but 
the main thing that we can say is that she was a lady of lower estate. And so because of that lower estate, it really frustrated Moses' sister, Miriam. Miriam had grown up. Miriam had grown up into a leader. If we look back in the Word of God, we'll see that Miriam uh, was, in effect, the leader of the women as they came across the Red Sea. She was the leader of the woman, women as she voiced her opinion to Moses. She was Moses' older sister. I mean, she had some position of authority in his life period. She had helped raise him. Remember Moses, uh, we remember the account in the New Testament says that Moses was a man of a smooth tongue. He was a man of a witty tongue. But in the Old Testament, Moses says to God when God calls him out, I'm slow of tongue and, I, and I'm not a good speaker. And so God appoints Aaron to be his speaker. And Aaron is the older brother of Moses as well. Well, Aaron and Miriam get frustrated with Moses. In essence, when Moses married Zipporah, it elevated Zipporah's status to Moses' wife. But this leader figure... Look, we are... We are there's... Really, if you study God's Word, there's little to be said about the word leader in the Word of God. It's more, more said about the idea of, of servant. We elect politicians and we call them leaders, but they're really not leaders. They're appointed politicians. They really are servants of the people. When we give them authority, then they have, then, then power corrupts them. And then that absolute power corrupts them absolutely. And we see this corruption in politics uh, all of the time. But we see this corruption as well in the ministry. We see this corruption in business. We see this corruption anytime someone is ele elevated to a position where they have no one to answer to and they are the ultimate authority. It's almost inevitable that we will see some type of corruption. And so Miriam and Aaron were frustrated with their brother. And so the first person I put, the minor person, was the Ethiopian woman. The first criticism was of the marriage of Moses because of this Cushite that he had married because she was of lower estate. The question of our identity is important. However, it is the reason for the criticism which comes next that's important because of the criticism of of Moses's wife the people begin to criticize Moses as well it's in interesting how a united front helps move the ball forward in any situation whether it's in uh, whether it's in politics, whether it's in sports, whether it's in ministry, whether it's in, in business. Our high school basketball coach called it, he called it a cancer. And he said, if you're a cancer to my team, because he was the coach of the team, if you are a cancer, it doesn't matter how talented you are, uh, who your parents are, how much money you have. None of that matters to me. As soon as you became a cancer, and early in our basketball career, we had two guys that, that were not getting the play in time. They thought they deserved They began to speak. And we as young guys watched them get exited from the team because they were going to be a cancer. They were going to undermine what he was trying to teach. And, and this is what happened with the children of Israel. Uh, here are the, the, the trial leaders, if you will, Aaron and Miriam and Moses. And, and Aaron and Miriam get frustrated with how God is going to, to decide to use them. Instead of being in the Lord's will, they wanted to uh, manipulate or guide God's will. And so we see the minor person being the Ethiopian. The second group of people we see are the many persons. People complained, and then God disciplined. Israelites complained about the hardship of manna. God sent a plague. What did He give them? He gave them quail. He changed their eating routine. They were not satisfied with what they had. They wanted more. They weren't satisfied. They were not content with what they had. They wanted more. And they didn't blame God before this discontentment. They blamed Moses because of this dis discontentment. They said, Moses, you are, you are the reason. Remember, think about, think about this for a minute in the life of Moses. He begins to be criticized by the people that he has freed. All at the same time, they begin to say these these absolutely crazy things about you took us out of bondage 
to bring us out here that we may die. But there are, there are many people that would say they would rather die than be in slavery for a lifetime. And so he had brought them out, the, a God who they did not see in essence, but they saw in the day as he led as a cloud and as a, and, and as a fire, and they saw his presence and they, and they watched Moses' work. They began to murmur against the fact that Moses was not feeding them the way that they wanted to be, fit, to be fed. Can you imagine at this time that that maybe the, that our food supplies would run low and we would begin to complain about the things that we eat. It's interesting to, to think about a, a generation, even the generation that I've grown up in, that unless we have what we want, we're not satisfied. We're not living with what we need. We're not living with eating certain things. Today, Marcy made a separate meal for me because I don't like what she was going to cook for everyone else. And I can be thankful that I have a wife that does that but, but really, as, as we were eating, I was looking at what she made, and I was like, and I can't be thankful for that, that that's made, that I didn't have any uh, help in creating. You know, I, there has to be something separate for the king of the house of the Ball family. And so uh, it convicted me, thinking about Moses, where I, I just couldn't be happy with, with carrots and what was in that, potatoes and chicken and all mixed up in one pot with just like a big juice, yuck. And I was like, I can't be con content with that. Amen, would you like to eat that? Yeah, yeah, that's what I figured. I wouldn't eat that with your mouth. But anyway, she made me this chicken ranch stuff that I love, and I'm, and I'm thankful for that. The children of Israel could not just be thankful for what God had given them. Once they got used to that, they wanted more. And they didn't want more of God, they wanted more of what they wanted. And they began to critique. Ten spies complained about the giants in the promised land. They died of plague. They wandered for 40 years until that generation died off. They complained to who? To Moses. Moses, you've brought us out here. Think about how, how Moses was commissioned by God to lead God's chosen people out of slavery, and Moses had fulfilled that part. You can see in your own self, if you played the part of Moses, when you came out of the mountain with the Ten Commandments, and you heard a ruckus in the camp, and you went down and you saw them dancing and partying and doing stuff, and they had taken their gold and made a golden calf, and they were worshiping this calf, how it would anger you that they just could not wait for a little while in the valley on God to see what God was going to do. They had to enact themselves. About the same thing that Saul did when, <clears throat> when Saul decided Samuel wasn't coming quick enough and he, and he uh, uh, made a sacrifice on the altar. He got out of his position and God cursed Saul because of that. He would not forgive him because of that. He held it against his account. But I'll be honest with you, he probably would have forgiven Saul because of it. But Saul would not seek the face of the Lord. Saul would seek the face of Samuel. David would seek the face of the Lord. Saul wanted the way he wanted it, how he wanted it, when he wanted it. And when he failed, he didn't repent to God. He repented to man. And that was the difference between David and Saul. David would repent to God. God would restore him. But beloved, there's always consequence for our action. Regardless of the restoration, there was a consequence for the action of David and his life as Aaron's been studying that with the teenagers and preaching about that last week. There was a consequence because of that. Because of that. There was a consequence to Moses' action when he smote the rock instead of speaking to the rock. And God said he wouldn't have his part in the promised land. See, Moses wasn't perfect either. But Moses was God's servant. So there was a minor person, the Ethiopian woman. There was many persons. And then things hit home. There was a major person. Miriam and Aaron. They spake against Moses, his brother and sister. Those closest to him. His worth, wasn't in the, his worth wasn't in the connection that he had with his family, but how he was seen by God. But I will say this about personal criticism of those that are close to you. It makes you reflect upon your foundations. 
It makes you wonder about your position. It makes you wonder about your, your direction. And, and Moses had taken that criticism from his brother and sister, his co-laborers, his partners. And, and because of that, he didn't lash out at Miriam and Aaron. I think he pitied them inside, but I, but I really think in the midst of that pity, he was probably just torn apart. That those people that he was closest to, who he had worked with, who were going to watch this move into the promised land, now none of them would end up getting there. None, none of them would see what God had prepared for them. We can say tonight that we're thankful for the grace of God, that even when we fail, we have an advocate with the Father, and even when we fail, one day we're going to go into the real promised land, that place of heaven, and it's not going to be on our account. It's going to be on the account of Jesus Christ. And, and that's, a, that's the difference between the law and grace. But Moses, God held Moses to the standard. So his family began to criticize him. The main criticism was one of a spiritual position and privilege. If we look back, we would see that, that Miriam says to Aaron, Has God only spoke to the people by Moses? They began to see that as the mouthpiece, they played a part in the role of leaving the servitude of Egypt and moving into the promised land. And because of the part that they played, they wanted to be exalted to the position of authority. Moses had done what? Moses had taken this time. He had been really born at a time when, when he should have died. He really, we could say that it was luck, but we would say that, that it was God's providence. And he was born at a time when, when he should have died. And he, then he was raised in a home that he should have never been raised in. Then he lived a life. And if we looked at Hebrews, we would see in, in the book of Hebrews that, that he chose to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to live with Pharaoh in the pleasures of this season. He had, he had this desire to serve God. And I believe God on this, in this place in Jethro, as, as He raised the sheep of someone else and He had been stripped of His authority, He began to learn about His identity. He began to fall in love, not only with the people, but fall in love with God. And, and we, in essence, have been stripped of our identity. Look at what we're doing tonight. You're sitting in cars. Listen to me on a trailer. We're fighting wind and we're right outside of a perfectly good building that would house all of us, two of them. We've been kind of stripped from our place. We've been stripped from our jobs. We've been stripped from our movement. We've been, these freedoms have been taken away from us and, and we should be reflecting and, and, and considering what really matters. And in that time and place, the, 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 the sister that had Help nurse him and grow him, probably change his diaper. The brother that he had played with and, and fought with and ran around in the courts of Pharaoh, they began to turn on him as well and they began to speak against him. And you can only imagine in the heart of Moses, he began to reflect and just began to think, what is, what is my worth? It's no wonder I'm on the backside here away from my bringing. It's no wonder that, that I'm marrying a, a Cushite woman or a Midianite woman in Zipporah. It's no wonder that, uh, that I'm not worth anything. Remember when God came to, and I'm going to, uh, who had the fleece? Um, Gideon, had, when God came in, he said, mighty man of valor. And, and Gideon kind of said, are you talking to me? Because he really wasn't a mighty man of valor, but he was, Gideon was going to serve a mighty God of valor. And God knew when he came to Gideon, he could get Gideon to follow him. And this was God's desire for, for Moses, not for Moses to be great, not for the name of Moses to be rang. Remember when David came in uh, into the city and, and the people began to cry, uh, Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. Man, it worked in the heart of Saul and, and anger worked into him. The fact that Saul could have had someone in his court with that kind of talent, he should have just rode David's uh, greatness right on into the future and finished and handed off the throne to David. But, but Saul did what? He got anger in his heart and an evil spirit began to torment him and he was changed so Moses begins to be criticized by by his brother and by his sister the main criticism was one of spiritual position and privilege the fact the position of the wife of Moses would irritate Miriam 
who as Moses' older sister would want the priority of the number of one woman in the camp. Her leading of the women in Exodus 15, which we talked about out of the Red Sea. Moses, being the leader of the camp, would upset, upset small souls who saw him as their little brother more than God's servant. Envy and pride are more interested in one's personal honor and man's honor than the honor of God and the prosperity of his work. And this is where Moses would find himself. And I would expect that if we took a poll tonight and we did not know the end of Moses nor the things of God, we would say of Moses, what do you think Moses should have done? And we would have say he should have fought back. He should have stood up. He should have told, put them in their place. He should have and he should have done all these things. And Moses didn't do one of those. He didn't do any of them. Because Moses had been a changed man when he was there tending to the sheep of Jethro. Moses had been a changed man when, when tending those sheep, he came upon this bush that burned but wasn't consumed. And he had walked into the presence of God. Moses was a changed man when, when he stood in the cleft of the rock and, and God hid his eyes as, as the goodness of God passed by and God removed his hand off of, off of Moses' eyes and Moses shined with a bright light so, so brightly that they veiled his face to be in the presence of the people. Moses was a changed man. Moses wasn't, the, wasn't this quick, witty tongue, sharp tongue, quick to react. He was still that. He embodied that. We see him break the tablets. We see him speak to the rock. We see his anger. But we also see him with Aaron stay the plague. We see him uh, build a, <coughs> a brazen serpent to free the people. We see him lead despite the murmuring. We see him going despite the criticism. And we see Moses just carrying on for God eventually till. God would bury Moses. God would take Moses away and he would lay him to rest. The reply of the criticism is found in verse number 3. You know, the fear is that in 2 Corinthians 10, 12, the Bible says, For we dare not make ourselves of the number that compare themselves with some that commend themselves, but they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves amongst themselves are not, not wise. We're hoping that in this time we're comparing ourselves to a holy God. You say, well, I fall short. That's right. And that's why the Bible says that, that we have come short of the glory of God. So what do we need? We need the power of God to work through us. We need the power of God to speak through us. But when that power of God works in us, when, when it works in us in preaching, when it works in us at our work, when it works in us, it's not us and our authority and our biblical knowledge and our ability to memorize the Scriptures and, and all of these things that we have done. It's truly our submission to God that has allowed God to work through us. Those that are unsubmitted to the Lord are not going to see God work through them. Or they're going to see the limit of their talent. And I don't want to be limited by my talents. I want to see God work. You know, today I would, I would like to see, you know, if this carried on for five years, cars stretched from here to the end of Crone Road, and, and not for the glory of Car Township Baptist Church or the glory of Pastor Alan Ball, but to the glory of God. It's not the number on, on Restream or Facebook or YouTube up there that says the number of people that are viewing the streams and watching and the comments that are made. To me, it's the simple names on there of the people that don't know Christ that have had the privilege of hearing the truth of God's Word. Not the privilege because I'm speaking it, but the privilege because it is the Word of God, but the privilege of being exposed to the truth as a result of a virus. I think what man meant for bad, I think what the coronavirus meant for bad in the regions and the minds of the, of, the, of the evil people that live amongst us in this world, God is using for good. God is using to reach people that need Christ, to put us on a platform in front of people that, that would have never seen. Today when I, when I left, I always look back to see the feed. I want to hear the audio. I want to see the video. How smooth did that run? Is it blippy? Is it? And because that's part of my OCD personality, I want to see that. But as soon as I pulled it up, I got a text message from a guy that I've been praying for, and he said, watch the service today. And I gasped within myself because I, I began to replay what I said 
said? Did I mention his name? What was said? Did I give the gospel with all of those things? And I thought there would have never been a time or another platform. I probably would have preached his funeral but he would have been too late to hear the truth of the gospel. And God has given him this opportunity in the midst of this perverse world to hear the life-giving truth. And so here's Moses in his reply to the criticism. The specifics was Moses was meek. Moses was meek. The Bible says he was the meekest man of all of the earth. We see meekness as weakness. I said in my, in, my, in my title, God is much when man is little. I pulled my notes out. Marcy likes to write down stuff and stick it in, in books and for bookmarks. And I end up having all these Bible verses all the time that I can go back to and look at. And this Bible verse was stuck right in the pages uh, when I turned to it. Coincidence or no? You decide. Isaiah 66, 2. For all those things hath my hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is of a poor and contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. Man, what a powerful verse out of the book of Isaiah where God would say, I am going to use those of a contrite spirit. Moses is what? Moses was the number two in command of the greatest nation and he was brought low. And it's funny, when he was brought low, God said what? He's the meekest man of all of the earth. Meekness did not uh, uh, reflect Moses' strength as far as we would say, meekness is weakness. But the definition of meekness is strength under control. Look, when strength was out of control, what did Moses do? He killed a man. He smote a rock. He broke some tablets. Boy, but when Moses had his strength under control, mighty was the work of God in his life. And God wanted to use him. God God did use him because he was meek. Because he was a servant that could be used. In a time when we inflate the personalities of people. In the time when when a nation is looking for, we've said this before, in a leader, in a president, in in an athlete, in a sporting person. I think about growing up and how times were different. and, And my hero was my dad. I didn't watch... TV and, and idolize ball players. Somebody used to say one time, who was your favorite ball player growing up? It was my dad was my favorite ball player. He beat me every time until I was about 14 years old. And he beat me bad. He was the best player I'd ever played against. Nobody had ever worked me over like my dad. And when I would get close, he would raise it to another level. He created this competitive drive inside of me. And, and, uh, and I got some of that competitive drive by playing cards with my mom and grandpa and all of them growing up as well. My grandpa used to say, I've never lost a hand of cards. My partner has lost a lot of them, but I've never lost any of them. And so my grandpa just thought he made no mistakes when it came to playing cards. And he was a good card player. But, but all of that did one thing. It drove and drove and drove. Now we have what? We've elevated the self-worth of so many human beings. How, how is it? Beloved, that a baseball player could be paid a million dollars per at bat. How does that happen? And it's because people have valued baseball. How is it that that an individual, just a human, that's a sinner, make 50 million a year playing basketball? Because we've elevated that status. One of the craziest things that we've got to listen to during this time, because we've watched a lot of interviews and reruns and statements, and, is the fact that so many of those people, they would thank God for their talent, but they absolutely do not promote God in their lifestyle. But they promote and they market themselves to the world because the more they're marketed, the more their value is and the more money they can make. Moses was not concerned about money anymore. He had had all the riches that the world could offer, and he was not concerned about that anymore. He was concerned about being God's man. 
That's what he was concerned about. Still in his flesh, but the man of God. The superiority of his meekness, we saw the specifics of his meekness. Meekness often viewed as uh, uh, today as weakness, shyness, passiveness, backwardness, femininity, a lack of courage, and as someone who would never protest anything. But the statement that Moses would make shows that meekness is far different than the common worldly view. Meekness is strength to hold your tongue when you are being attacked by unjust criticism. It's the humbleness that does not arrogantly strut your calling and position. And it is the faith that trusts God to take care of your vindication. Meekness did not stop Moses from being firm or strong or outspoken leader for God. Nor did it stop Moses from strongly opposing evil in the camp. But Moses was not only had a specific meekness, He had a superior meekness. The Bible says, Above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. Moses was the meekest of the meek. His meekness far exceeded the meekness of Miriam and Aram if they had any meekness at all. If they had been meek, they would have not been able to attack Moses. Furthermore, all the charges made against Moses by Aaron and Miriam, are canceled out by Moses' meekness. You know what I have found out, and this isn't a message about criticism, but you know what I have found out about criticism? Most of the time, the people that are doing the criticizing, the things they are saying are the very things that they struggle with. And that's why they recognize them in someone else. Look, we... We all have weaknesses, amen? You can honk your horn for that. We all have weaknesses. Nash, have your wife reach over and honk the horn on that one, amen? We all have weaknesses. And the only way, if the only way I can elevate myself is to point out Ed's weaknesses or Bill's weaknesses or Dennis's weaknesses, if the only way I can elevate myself is to point out them weaknesses, it's really not me being stronger. It's me being foolish. How is it that I'm going to lift up these individuals? We saw this morning, the the way that we're going to magnify the Lord greatly is if we do it together. God would take a weak Aaron, a weak Miriam, and a weak Moses, and He would use those three to make a strong God, or really just reveal a strong God, because God was strong without those individuals. But in order for God to use Moses, He would have to do what? He would have to abase Himself. He would have to be weak. Paul said this of himself, For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. He's talking about a man that was in the body and out of the body. I would not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Remember there was a time in... In 2 Corinthians, when Paul was addressing baptism, and he says there are people that are beginning to fight amongst themselves because they were baptized by me or they were baptized by Apollos. And they were saying that they were, I'm a convert of Paul, and I'm a convert of Apollos. And they were trying to elevate their status by who they were the convert of. And Paul said, I wish that I would have baptized none of you. I wish that I would have baptized none of you. Because it's not that Paul or Apollos can baptize anybody with the Holy Spirit, but of God. And he says in that area, he wishes that he would be a castaway, that when he came, people would see God. I remember reading Billy Sunday's book on on his uh, revival move across America, and it it reminds me of this. Billy Sunday would go into towns uh, all across our country. A lot of towns in Kentucky are still dry today as a result of Billy Sunday's revivals. 
and he would go into a town and, and, the, and they would go into the parks and preach. And so uh, the government would come and run them out of the park. And then so they would go down to the corner and the government would run them out of the corner. And I remember in one account, he, he went to a cornfield and at that cornfield, uh, a farmer came out and he mowed down four acres of a cornfield and 500 people showed up for the meetings. And when they got there for the meetings, he preached on top of a combine. I think that stuff is fascinating. And hundreds of people got saved. And he was at a meeting one time, and a guy met him, and he said, how many people do you think got saved at that meeting? And Billy Sunday replied like this. Over half of the people made professions. I probably saved 200 and God probably saved 20. The ones that I saved won't go to heaven. The ones that God saved have a new residence. And because Billy Sunday had become so popular, people would just go to his crusades to make professions of faith to say they were a part of the converts of Billy Sunday's crusades. Paul says... For this thing, I besought the Lord thrice, this thorn in the flesh, that it might depart from me. And you know this, these verses. And, he saw, and God said unto, unto Paul, because he was not going to remove the thorn, he says, My grace is sufficient for thee. And listen to these words. Little is much when God is in it, but great is man, or great is God, when man is little. He says, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Paul says, Most gladly, therefore, would I rather in glory in mine infirmities than the power of Christ, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I would take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sakes. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Why was Paul Moses used in the fashion that God would use him? Because just he wasn't just meek. He was the meekest man of all of the earth. Moses asked the question when he came to God, Who shall I say hath sent me when I come into the presence of Pharaoh? And God just said, I am. God wasn't concerned about the strength of Moses. He was concerned that Moses would rely upon the strength of God. It's funny because Moses did not argue with him. What do you mean I am? How is that going to do anything? What am I going to say? How is he going to respond to that? I think about being married to the person I'm married to and uh, sitting at lunch today with the person that Caleb is married to and the hundreds of questions that they ask about things just so they can know and question upon question and question upon question. And Moses just does what? He just hears. He goes to Pharaoh and he probably recounts one of the goofiest statements that you've ever heard in the Bible, when Pharaoh says, who has sent you? And Moses says, I am. It's not a response. But that was God's response for the meekest man of all of the earth. And God would unleash a terror on Pharaoh. I believe in part just paying back for the, the slavery and the killing of all those boys that took place those years before when Moses was small. And he would unleash a fury upon Pharaoh and Pharaoh would actually pay for the leaving of the children of Israel to the Red Sea. And I think about as they moved across the Red Sea. Here Moses had been the leader of sheep. And now he stood upon the, the banks of a, of a river. And the, and the children or the, or the Egyptians were chasing them down from behind. And there was a wall of fire between them and the Egyptians. And God parted the river. And Moses walks across on dry land. You say it's not possible. Friend, everything's possible with God. God can do anything. He's only limited by our pride. If we would become meek, it's untold what God could do 
Not would do. He doesn't, do, he doesn't owe us anything. But what He could do. But He would have to know that you and I were in a position of meekness, not for power, but for His honor and His glory. What will it look like when most of this crowd comes back that first Sunday morning in the weeks to come? I hope that this event has forever transformed your walk with God. I know those that it has transformed in them walking away from God. But I'm hoping for us it transforms us in walking closer to God. I hope we can look back one day and say to our children, our grandchildren, Lord, that we would just rapture out of here today. I wouldn't worry about any of it. But that we can look back to them and say there was a time in our life when we, when we sat in a parking lot and we listened to a man try to preach the Word of God as the podium hit him and the, and the camera fell over and his mic was windy and the FM transmitter wasn't perfect and God changed my life. Because it isn't the clarity of my voice that changes lives. It's the power of the Holy Spirit and our surrender to that Spirit. Oh, that God, that in our lives, God would be great and we would be weak. Not weak in puniness, but weak in our mere presence of the Lord. And that we would see that when God is in something, little is much when God is in it. But why keep it little? I was thinking yesterday, and I'll close with this, every person that we hug, now, this will be silly, but this is a V that's greater than. Right? All right. All my math people with me? Every person that we hug when we come back, what we're saying to them is, you are greater than me. And we funnel them into our lives. And I believe as God, as Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary and is at His arms out wide, He said to the world, I'm dying for you because you are greater than me. And He's been given a name that is above every name, but God allowed Him to die in our place. And that's why God has seated Him at His right hand. Oh, that God, that we would learn the lesson of meekness. And it's something that me, I'm learning over and over and over and over. His pride just keeps beat down like a railroad spike over and over and over. And I rear my ugly head, and God says, put it back down, son. And we grow and grow and grow in the Lord. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for tonight. Lord, I thank You for the distraction. But Lord, I thank You for Your Spirit as You've moved in and as You're trying to speak to hearts. Lord, I know there's as many distractions as I'm dealing with. Everyone is dealing with them, Lord. Let us hear you through the noise. Let us hear you through, through the distraction. Lord, let your Spirit work in us to change us, to be more like you. Draw us to. Lord, I pray that, that we would increase in wisdom, but Lord, we would increase in meekness. And Lord, we would understand you greater than we ever have before. Thank you for this crowd. Thank you for their, for their support and encouragement by their presence. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing in Car Township Baptist Church, Lord, even amidst all that's going on. In Christ's name, amen and amen.